All right, so we're going to be talking about one tiny bit of statistical inference, a good place to start, and that's estimation of a proportion. And then in a subsequent video, a comparison of two proportions using the same example. So we're going to use uh, exit polls from uh, the US presidential election 2016, specifically the returns in Florida. And we're going to look at the overall vote for Trump versus uh, Clinton, uh, actually focusing on the proportion of Trump votes specifically, uh, since there were also Clinton votes and other or um, you know, smaller parties. Uh, do take the exit polls uh, in the comparisons we're going to do, which are Latino versus non-Latino votes and uh, Cuban versus non-Cuban Latinos. Uh, with a grain of salt, exit polls are, um, have traditionally been very good for overall numbers in a state and for certain demographics like male and female um, and much less so for uh, race and ethnicity and uh, certain other um, demographics that they are not optimized for. So let's just take it for granted. Let's assume that um, exit polls are, uh, let's treat them as if they're giving us a simple random sample of, of voters, uh, although we know they're, that's not quite true. And so we can see the um, non-Latino uh, vote, 54% voted for Trump. 35% of all Latinos uh, voted for Trump, much uh, fewer. Um, we would probably be um, correct and safe in assuming that Latinos voted for Trump at lower numbers, uh, even in Florida, where the um, vote is often... Um, greater for Republican than it is elsewhere when looking among Latinos. And a lot of that uh, has been historically attributable to the um, Cuban, Cuban-American uh, population who has been more supportive of, of Republican candidates. Uh, so we're going to do some looking at the uh, those who self-identify as Cuban. Uh, and you can actually see in the estimate 54%. So they were voting for Trump in higher numbers than the overall uh, non-Latino vote. Uh, although we can ask whether that difference between 54 and 40, 50, sorry, 54 percent and 51 percent, if that, uh, how confident we are that that's uh, a real difference that Cubans voted uh, in greater numbers for Trump than uh, all certainly Latinos and all non-Latinos, that difference uh, is distinguishable from zero. And we have non-Cuban Latinos way you can you can see 26 percent, only a quarter voting for Trump, the lowest number here. Uh, so we're going to do um, comparisons the way that they broke it up. Uh, they, I don't know exactly how they asked, but in, in sort of race category, which they included, um, typically Latino is, uh, or Hispanic is added on as a, an additional uh, question. But if they were asked, uh, if they had to choose one between white, black, Latino, and Asian, uh, we're going to see actually these numbers don't uh, match up very well with uh, other numbers in Latinos. And in part, this is because, um, although I'm not exactly sure how the uh, how the question was asked, but in terms of categorization, uh, either the probably the self identification for Latinos, some might, if forced to choose between Latino, white, or black, uh, some might choose white, some might choose black, some might choose Latino, depending on which they um, identify more with in terms of uh, what's often thought of as a racialized identity as Latinos become. In recent years, um, and when we look at uh, specifically ethnicity as Cuban or other um, uh, national origins, uh, Puerto Rican, Central American, Venezuelan are um, common uh, more and more in, in different regions of Florida. Um, we see the Cuban uh, self-identified uh, Cuban um, Americans voting for Trump, fifty-four percent. Other Latinos, twenty-six percent. Again, the Latino and non-Latino here, Latino is adding up to 16%. When taken as a racial category, it was 18%. Um, not sure exactly, other than treating it as ethnicity, treating it as um, race where one has to choose, um, uh, you, you get different uh, kinds of outcomes. But um, take that, too, with a, a grain of salt. Uh, and, of course, um, you know, all of this sort of measurement is sort of major asterisk, right? Because um, these are socially constructed categories, and um, you know, even things like whether you're Cuban or other Latino. If your mother is Cuban and your father is Puerto Rican, there's uh, 
variability and, and sort of um, it's, it's, it's strange to ask someone to choose between those two. In fact, the answer um, is more complicated. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about estimating uh, the proportions, the true proportion of the population, and these populations are specific, really, subpopulations. These are voters, uh, the NL is, we're looking for the proportion voting for Trump who are non-Latino. Um, that little hat over the P says this is our point estimate, this is our best single number estimate um, using the proportion of the sample, so 51% or 0.51. Uh, P hat L is the Latino um, proportion voting for Trump, 35%. P hat C is the Cuban identified uh, Trump voters, 54%. Remember the remaining percent, in this case uh, 46%, are all voters who voted for Hillary Clinton or other or did not vote for the presidential ticket at all, maybe voted down ballot for someone else. Um, and then finally, P hat NCL are the non-Cuban Latino proportion. So our estimate of that population's voting was 26%, um, but we're trying to use that to estimate the actual P, the actual proportion. Okay. To do that, we need to uh, look at the numbers in the sample for each of these subsamples, uh, and you know, as you should know the bigger sample one gets the more precise the estimates are uncertainty uh, gets lessened around our point estimates uh, and so you have the corresponding um, sample sizes non-latino around 3280 I didn't get this precise numbers but these are approximate using the percentages that were given uh, the number of Latino respondents and again this is Latino is defined in that racial category versus black, white, Asian, other, 720. Number of uh, Cuban self-reporting, 240. Number of non-Cuban Latino, 400. So here again, C400 plus 240 does not add up to 720. These were taken from uh, different breakdowns. So um, we want to be cautious about doing comparisons across those. Uh, okay, so the standard error, we have our, our <laughs> best estimate, but we want to give some sense of uncertainty. So the way that we do that is to uh, estimate a standard error, uh, which is a feature of the sampling distribution of these, um, these estimators, these sample proportions. And in, when we're working with the dichotomous uh, outcome, they, in this case, voted for Trump or didn't vote for Trump, and we're doing um, proportions, we're estimating the proportion from the whole population of interest. It's straightforward. The standard error is, you know, as, as long as we have the sample size n, uh, the standard error is coming entirely from the um, the proportion. So if there were a tr if we knew the true proportion p voting for Trump in this subpopulation of interest, we would calculate the true standard error as the square root of that proportion times one minus the proportion. That is the proportion in that group voting for Trump times the vote not for tr proportion not voting for Trump divided by the size of the sample, and then take the square root. Uh, but we actually don't know uh, P itself, and so we're going to, the little hat over the SE says, we're estimating the standard error. Uh, we're getting, really, actually, the estimate of the standard error. I, I didn't really need the hat and the approximately equal. I should say the true standard error is approximately equal, or the approximate standard error is equal, since both of those are describing an approximation. Um, so we're going to use the the estimates we have, and uh, in general, we won't do too poorly uh, using the estimates we have. Uh, worth noting, and this is something that is relevant in many uh, polls that you will see when there's lots of different questions, um, the standard error of an estimated proportion, right, of this, this sample um, proportion as an estimate of the true proportion, is always less than, right, the biggest it's ever going to be is when the true proportion is... Uh, 50%. So 0.5 times 1 mi minus 0.5, whenever it's lower than that, like 0 0.49, 0 0.45, 0 0.1 times 0 0.9, uh, you can do it yourself and convince yourself that for any proportion p lower than 0 0.5, this numerator is going to get smaller. And so that means that the standard error is never going to be bigger than what happens when it's 
and what happens when it's 50-50 is that numerator inside the square root becomes 0.25, like 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25 over n, take the square root, and then the square root of 0.25 gets us back to 0.5, so we have, we break up the square root numerator and denominator, we have 0.5 over square root of n, that's one half in the numerator, which works out to one over two times the square root of n. And so what you actually will see oftentimes in polls is they'll just use that as a sort of conservative standard error, right? Because um, it's never gonna be bigger than that. So when they say, hey, plus or minus two points, they may actually be using this and know that that's um, a, a generous um, confidence interval. Uh, so it's it's they're they're being safe to say that that it's um, a, a kind of a, a um, you know, sort of a typical way of dealing with uncertainty or not even a typical way to instead of just estimating the uncertainty they're cap they're put, placing a bound on it that it's never going to be larger than that okay so um, we can use that here we're going to use the uh, estimation formula above though now it's down below um, and so you can see the um, uh, point, it's just, uh, so 0.51, if we're talking about non-Latinos, 0.51 is our estimate for the proportion who voted for Trump, 1 minus 0.51, the estimated proportion who did not vote for Trump among non-Latinos, divided by the number in our sample. Right, So a large sample that were non-Latinos, and we get a standard error error of just under 0.01 or 1%. Uh, so we can use that to form confidence intervals or to just get a general sense of our uncertainty. Simply providing the estimate and uh, standard error gives you a sense of general uncertainty because loosely speaking what it's saying is typically we can expect our estimate to be, you know, uh, very loosely, it's not really on average, but our, our sort of expected uh, distance between our estimate and the truth is about one percent uh, and then for the next standard error following again uh, this time for proportion of Latinos voting for Trump standard error 0 0.018 approximately for Cubans 0 0.032 why are these bigger why is that so much bigger uh, it's driven mostly by the smaller sample size right no, note uh, also there's two things happening actually the um, those estimates, those pr estimated proportions that are closer to 0.5 are going to have the bigger standard errors, right? So that'll be a larger standard error. It's going to be tending toward a larger standard error than, say, if you plugged in 0.35 for p-hat. But what's even a larger driver is uh, of standard error size is the um, sample size. Small sample sizes, small numbers in the denominator mean larger overall standard errors. And this is about 3%. And, uh, as the standard error. And then uh, for non-Cuban Latinos, just over 2%. Okay, so those are your standard errors. Uh, you at the very least want to, you never just want to give an estimate without some indication of uncertainty. A standard error is one way to do it. That leaves your reader uh, to make their own judgments about, um, you know, they can make any confidence interval they want. Uh, but if uh, one thing, that, one one confidence interval that that you don't see a lot of that I think is a is a good confidence interval as one of a couple, two or three to consider to give a sense of uncertainty. This is one that um, Andrew Gelman, one of the authors of our textbook, likes. I don't recall if he uses it much in this book. Maybe, um, but here the idea is, you know. Look, I'm gonna. This is gonna be a pretty liberal confidence interval. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to make it as narrow as possible, and still say there's a better chance that this interval covers the true proportion than not. So this is a 68. It's just over two thirds confidence interval, right? So that is to say, loosely speaking, uh, you know, these. If I if I I'm always giving confidence intervals that are 68% um, confidence intervals, I should expect. Uh, typically two out of every three of these that I'm creating to actually can contain the, the true value. Um, so it's a, this is a, a more likely than not sort of scenario, more likely than not my interval contains the true value. Um, and one nice thing about that 68% is just that you're adding one standard error and subtracting one standard error to get it. So here it's uh, just using the same um, level of specificity as the original estimate, 51% plus or minus 
uh, 1%, so somewhere between 50 and 52% of non-Latino voters in Florida voted for Trump, uh, plus or minus 35% uh, plus or minus 2% for Latinos, somewhere between 33 and 37, that's including uh, all uh, self-identified Latinos in the, on the race question. Um, 54% of Cubans, very high number, but plus or minus 3%, we're not as precise. We can say with 68% confidence, and we'll talk more about what that means or whether it's even a meaningful idea uh, at, at some point. Uh, but 68% confidence interval officially, it's between 51 and 57 uh, percent of Cubans voted for Trump and non-Cuban Latinos way down compared to that it seems 26 percent plus or minus two percent so between 24 and 28 percent small sample size but the fact that the um, that the estimated proportion was far away from 50 percent helped to keep the standard error low so here are confidence intervals now the next thing we're going to want to do in in a in the follow-up video is we're going to want to Oh, no, actually, let's do 95% confidence intervals first. I forgot I set that up. So a more typical one, but there's nothing magical about it. So I, I think it's it's useful to do things like 90, 89%. I sometimes see with Gelman 99% because everyone in social science and elsewhere is just jumping on 95% out of habit, and it's totally ad hoc, and so you don't want to put too much um, meaning into, into that sort of historical accident. But here you go. It's approximately the estimate plus or minus two standard errors, um, and so for non-Latinos, the estimates would be 49 to 53 percent. So I have greater confidence that that interval contains the true value, um, but it's a wider. Uh, the trade-off is it's a it's a less precise, more confidence, but less precise estimate. Between 31 and 39 percent voted for Trump among Latinos, among Cubans between 48 and 60 percent. So it's leaving open the possibility maybe even fewer than 50 percent voted for him. Probably not, but um, as far as that confidence interval can't, goes, we can't rule it out. And non-Cuban Latinos, somewhere between 22 and 30 percent. Okay, so for comparisons of proportions up next, I just want to point out that it's tempting, and very loosely we will sometimes give in to this temptation, and it, um, but it's tempting to compare uh, confidence intervals and say, for example, hey, you know, uh, non-Cuban Latino confidence interval does not overlap. Uh, let's say the one of these other ones, like um, non-Latinos, and therefore they're definitely distinct. We can't quite say that. We can't just compare confidence intervals for their overlap. Uh, we have to um, set up an estimator for the difference in the proportions. So the next thing we're going to do uh, is to look at the difference in proportions uh, in the true proportions as estimated by the difference in the estimated proportions, but then we also have to create a new standard error for the um, difference in proportions estimator.